seeing more school districts, at least in Virginia, for example, last night, deciding to go online only. What does the president say to parents out there who are now going, okay, what do I do with my kids? Yeah, the president has said um, unmistakably that he wants schools to open, and I was just in the Oval talking to him about that. And when he says open, he means open and full, kids being able to attend each and every day at their school. Uh, the science should not stand in the way of this. Uh, and as Dr. Scott Atlas said, I thought this was a good quote. Of course we can do it. Everyone else in the Western world, our peer nations, are doing it. We are the outlier here. You know how that soundbite was reported by... Uh you know, the mainstream media, including uh, fake fake news superstar Jim Acosta over at CNN, uh, as well as a lot of other people, that Kaylee McEnany as the White House press secretary is saying that the science is not allowed to be a consideration. The science cannot stand in the way of the agenda of the Trump administration to reopen schools. Such a lie, right? We can all we all know what she's saying. The science cannot stand in the way of reopening because the science favors reopening. That's what she is saying. But one of the favorite games of and and they do it partially because they're idiots and partially out of just spite. It's a spiteful thing to do. The media in the era of Trump, whether it's the president himself or any anyone around him, anyone on his team, they pretend they don't have a sense of humor they don't understand sarcasm. They don't have an, a, a real grasp of the plain meaning of words in the English language. They, they act like, you know, these are people who are journalists in English and they act like English all of a sudden is a third language that they're not sure they could even, you know, order dinner in. But, but, but wait, that's what the person said directly. So we're just going to quote those words and not. No, no intonation, context, all of those things. No idea. Right. They're they're completely uh, blind to the reality of how of how people communicate. But look, the Democrats have a very obvious agenda with all of this. If, in fact, they can keep schools shut down, not in every place, but in a lot of places. Trump's going to win. I'm sorry. Trump's going to lose. Trump's going to lose. They know it. If they can keep uh, schools shut down, Trump's going to lose. I mean, that's not a sure thing, but it's a it's a pretty likely one. And think of what they were willing to do before. Right. The the apparatus, the political establishment in 2016 put forward Hillary Clinton, pretended she had not violated the Espionage Act over 100 times in a criminally reckless fashion, which she clearly did. So change the law for her and also. We're setting up the bogus insurance policy of using the deep state actors within the DOJ and the FBI to target President Trump and bring him down. Should he actually win? Getting that whole Russia collusion thing going. That was an absurdity. It was an insanity. And there has been no accountability for it whatsoever. None. Zero. So why should we think that they'd be any less utterly insane now when it comes to sacrificing so much of the of what's good, so much of what would be helpful to the country in order to make sure that Trump loses. Uh, they're they're fine with this trade off. OK, kids are going to miss, you know, what is it? Another semester, call it, and basically half a school year. And then in January 2021, the schools can reopen. I, I'm getting messages from people. I'll tell you this because I'm very vocal on this issue. Um, I, I've been vocal on this for a long time. And I'm getting messages from people who know me in not from my work, but who are liberals who know me in private life. And they're they're all terrified of children going back to school. And I look and I just want to write them and say. Europe has opened all of its schools. What is wrong with you? It's our they're already doing. We've already run the experiment. It's already happening. So why are we? And New York has almost no covid cases right now. I mean, in the, in the hundreds, it's very, very minimal. Same thing with New Jersey. Some states, I'm confident, have hit their peak and are about to turn turn the corner, and then they'll be done. And it's very likely they'll never have another COVID, uh, COVID surge like this again. But you have less than a dozen kids have died in school. I think the number is like eight or nine under the age of, of 18 have died in the United States from COVID so far. It's a very small... 
more die from the flu every year in school. So why are people saying, I've got people reaching out to me that it's heartless and cruel to want schools to reopen. Are, are they heartless and cruel when every year kids die? Which, you know, Dying from the flu is just as rough as dying from COVID. You're dead. Same, a lot of the same mechanisms on the body. It's terrible, right? But so why one and not the other? The fear centers, the Democrats have really gone after the fear centers of people's brains now. And you can't have... You can't have an a honest discussion with with folks when they're just terrified. And I'm not talking about, you know, at the leadership level, the Democrat Party wants schools to be shut down for politics and power. But there are a lot of people who I mean, they're reaching out to me personally saying you don't understand. It's so terrifying for our, for our kids. You don't have kids, so you don't you don't get it. I've had someone tell me that. Mm, sorry. That's that's actually not. That's not changing the reality of what the data tells us and what it means for those kids to not be in school. Uh, you had the New York City mayor announcing a plan yesterday to provide child care for 100,000 children in the fall using community centers and libraries and other spaces. And to this I say, so it's safe to gather kids in New York, according to the Democrats, in large groups indoors, it's just not safe to teach them anything while the government does that. Yeah, that seems legit. That seems about right. So child care, they're going to start to provide, they say, but not no schools. Why is that? Why are they put why are they put the children at risk? If it's so risky to have a school, why is it risky to be in child care? If they're going to tell me that it's because if you're under the age of five, you're at really low risk. I'm going to say. Okay, now we're just having a conversation with crazy people, because if you're under the age of 18, you're at really low risk. And quite honestly, if you're under the age of 50, you're at entirely manageable risk. So what are we even talking about? Well, we know this is about everything other than safety for a lot of people. This is about so many other things. And um, the politics of this could not be any more obvious. And that brings me to mask mandates now people seem to be confused on this one in georgia for example there are there are man there's a, a fight now over whether cities can mandate masks and the state of georgia under governor kemp is saying look we want we encourage people to wear a mask but we're not going to allow cities to make these kinds of designations on their own this is a state power not a city power here's governor kemp play clip six now, I know that many well-intentioned and well-informed Georgians want a mask mandate. And while we all agree that wearing a mask is effective, I'm confident that Georgians don't need a mandate to do the right thing. I know that Georgians can rise to this challenge, and they will. And I know that Georgians will do their part to defeat this deadly virus. I mean, I think everyone is doing their part by going forward with their lives and trying to be responsible while our government is increasingly, in my opinion, just reckless. I have not given up. I will not give up on a very basic concept that I never get a good answer for here. I want to know where in the Constitution it says that all of your freedoms can be suspended on the capricious whim of a state governor for as long as he or she wants because of a disease that has a 99.7% survival rate. If anyone wants to fight with me on this one, okay, let's, let's play this out. If a governor has the authority to shut down some businesses but not others, some areas but not others, stay in your home, put a covering over your face, or we will fine you. Stay home or we will perhaps quarantine, which is just a fancy way of saying imprison you. If a governor, if a governor can do that in, for example, New York, where COVID is, is effectively a non-issue right now. And I know and I'm so sorry. Those of you who are in Florida and Texas and Arizona uh, and Georgia are going through this right now. Those are the major hot spots. Uh, it's it's not really an issue in New York. And yet we're still at the whim of this dictatorial moron governor cuomo you look at california 
And I've actually seen heat maps, you know, that show uh, density of, of a, a measured issue. Heat maps where California has probably the highest mass compliance of any state in the country. Why is California having a huge surge? Everyone's been wearing masks there. Masking all over the place. Now, this many months into it, California has a, has a big spike in COVID cases and is now on a lockdown. Not a full-on shelter in place, but pretty close. I mean, if masks are so effective, why, why would that happen? Everyone's wearing masks. People I know who live in California who mask all the time have told me, look, I'm, I'm somebody who believed them and wore a mask all the time. Still got sick. Every public interaction they're going, every store they went to, wearing a mask all the time. Wearing masks in their cars driving alone. Still get sick. Oh, but if you don't wear a mask, you're a bad person. This is what, this is what we're told. And if you question where the legal authority is for this, they just dismiss you and say that you're some kind of a, you know, some kind of a loon. You're a conspiracy theorist. Well, can a governor shut us down for a flu? Can the governor shut down every time there's a flu season? What, what other health issues can the, can the government, uh, can a governor declare? Explain to me under the current logic why this can't work. A governor could say that gun violence is a public health crisis. And so we're going to lock down the state and go door to door and seize all firearms under this public health crisis. Before you say, Buck, they would never do that, which I don't think that many of you would. Where, what am I missing here? It's a health crisis. People are people are dying. Don't you want people to stop dying? It's a health crisis. You'd say, Buck, but the Second Amendment. Yeah. Is there is there also is there any law that says that you're not allowed to leave your home? The shelter in place order is what? It's just the governor can say stay home or else. It's martial law, folks. That's what that turns into really quickly. It's just this is the way it's going to be. Curfews at night, shelter in place, all for your own good? No, thank you. I'll take my chances. Oh, but if you take your chances, you're putting other people at risk. Okay, so I have no freedom. That's Now we finally work this all the way through. I have no freedom. I have no autonomy. Every aspect of my existence is at the whim of the governor of my very blue, very statist state. And for a lot of you in other places across the country... You're at the whim of your governor, too. Some of them are a little bit better than ours, although I'm still disappointed in what Governor Abbott has been saying recently. Play clip 11. You know, it seems like I get this question about a thousand times a day, and there uh, seems to be rumors out there uh, about a looming shutdown. And let me tell you, there is no shutdown coming. Let me tell you two reasons why. Uh, one is because uh, I have uh, now... Uh, put into place a statewide uh, requirement uh, that everyone wear a face mask. This is the best standard as articulated this week uh, by the head of the CDC saying that we will be able to uh, contain COVID-19 if everyone will simply adopt this practice that is now in place across the entire state of Texas. And then the second thing, of course, is it was just a few weeks ago uh, that I ordered the closure of bars. So the CDC says now you got to wear a mask. That's what we're being told. CDC saying you got to wear a mask. Remember, the CDC was explicitly telling us earlier this year, not only is mask wearing not important, to do it was a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not making that up. You can all check that. That's a fact. That was the guidance earlier this year. Now it's if you don't wear a mask, you're putting people at risk. Now, of course, I've always said masks are situational for people working in hospitals. You know, even even a five percent mitigation of risk in a hospital setting may be worth it. But is it worth it for healthy people going about their lives every day, especially out in the open air? Uh, the CDC that gave us the faulty tests in the early days of this pandemic, when it would have been particularly useful and save lives, to be able to test quickly to try to contain the spread. Once the spread got beyond a certain level, there was no way that we were going to be able to contain it and shut it down and all this. And this has turned into a fantasy. If you look at the, the curve in place after place, and then you know the, the severity of the peak is determined by you know the density of population, susceptibility of the population, generally speaking, to the virus, you know that overall health, 
overall age of the population. These are factors that determine whether you've got a big spike or a little. But the duration of the curve in place after place is about eight weeks. It, the virus comes in, it spreads for eight weeks, and then it's, then it's done. And maybe it comes back at some level, but you get closer and closer to herd immunity. I, I, I want to share with you, I've been telling you about this theory, what I think is really happening with the virus. And it's not my theory. It's a theory from medical experts that I think makes sense. And it has to do with this herd immunity threshold, HIT. Let's get into it. I can't believe we're being evicted from our home that we didn't even sell. That's what Deborah said when she learned that she was the victim of home title fraud, which is a crime that can actually cost you your home. Title fraud is not covered by insurance or identity theft services. The only trusted folks to protect you are over at Home Title Lock. Your home's legal titles online where cyber thieves find it and forge your signature stating you sold your home to them. In Deborah's case, she didn't know she was a victim until the eviction notice arrived. Home Title Lock puts a virtual barrier around your home's title. If tampering is detected, they instantly mobilize to stop it. So go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're a victim and don't know it. Use code BUCK for 30 free days of protection. That's code BUCK at HomeTitleLock.com. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com. What was your reaction when you learned that the governor of your state filed a lawsuit against you? Completely dumbfounded. It is a waste of resources, taxpayer dollars, um, as we are struggling to make sure that our children have access to technology and broadband so that they can learn virtually in the fall because it's very likely they won't be able to return to school. Um, as our hospitals are at capacity, as we are woefully behind with access to testing and contact tracing, it is mind-boggling that this governor, who did not know that this virus was asymptomatic until we were well into the pandemic, would waste resources on suing me personally um, and our city council for a mass mandate and advisory voluntary business recommendations and guidelines. Yeah, uh, that's a lot of... A lot of uh, fancy words when the problem here is the law still counts. The Constitution still matters. Even during a pandemic, even when people are upset and afraid and there are real challenges and everything else, the law still counts. And you don't get to just say, well, we're going to make it up as we go along. I I'm, I'm, a, I'm astonished. And how little pushback, quite honestly, there has been from the population, uh, from from Americans about what's going on in many states. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to get into in greater detail some of these just completely. It, these rules are incoherent now. And they've already shown us during the BLM marches that public health takes a backseat to political agendas. There's no there's no turning back from that. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle. There's no making things all better now. No, we understand who the people calling for lockdowns really are and what really matters to them because they were silent, silent while there were protests about police violence, silent, and even justified it. That was the worst. The ones who were saying, well, it's really more important for public health and it's the better, it's a more important thing, so we're just going to say okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not letting it go. I'm not forgetting and I'm not forgiving. I can't believe we're being evicted from our home that we didn't even sell. That's what Deborah said when she learned that she was the victim of home title fraud, which is a crime that can actually cost you your home. Title fraud is not covered by insurance or identity theft services. The only trusted folks to protect you are over at Home Title Lock. Your home's legal titles online where cyber thieves find it and forge your signature stating you sold your home to them. In Deborah's case, she didn't know she was a victim until the eviction notice arrived. Home Title Lock puts a virtual barrier around your home's title. If tampering's detected, they instantly mobilize to stop it. So go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're a victim and don't know it. 
Use code BUCK for 30 free days of protection. That's code BUCK at HomeTitleLock.com. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com. I think this is the single most important theory out there right now that explains so much of what we're facing. And I've mentioned it to you before. It's starting to gain some traction, but it won't gain a lot of traction because it's not useful to the Democrat narrative. They don't really want to talk about it. And it's a Reuters piece from just last week on this. There are many others now that are popping up. And here's the title. Scientists focus on how immune system T cells fight coronavirus in absence of antibodies. Say, well, hold on a second. We've had all this talk about antibodies and herd immunity and serology testing, blood tests meant to determine the presence of antibodies in your system after fighting off an infection with COVID-19. But how could, how do T cells factor in this? Well, T cells are just another part of your immune system response, and a very important one, right? These are the the white blood cells that we always talk about with, oh, you need, you know, what's your white blood cell count? You look at your T cells. This is the fighting back against viruses, against bacteria that happens within the body all the time. And here's a theory that I'm going to present to you, raised by scientists, that I have talked to doctors about who say it is completely plausible, There's no reason to believe that this is not true. All we lack is the data to say that it is true. And there's a lot of reason to think, just based on the uh, factors that we're seeing played across the country, that this is what's happening. Here's the Reuters piece. As scientists question whether the presence or absence of antibodies to the novel coronavirus can reliably determine immunity, some are looking to a different component of the immune system known as T cells for their role in protecting people in the pandemic. Recent studies show that some recovered patients who tested negative for uh, coronavirus antibodies did develop T cells in response to their COVID-19 infection. While the studies are small and have yet to be reviewed by outside experts, some scientists now say people who experience a mild illness or no symptoms at all from the new coronavirus may be eliminating the infection through this T cell response. The findings add to the evidence that an Effective COVID-19 vaccine will need to, t- uh, need to prompt T cells to work in addition to producing antibodies. Um, my friends, this is huge, if this is correct. This is enormous. When a virus gets past the body's initial defenses, which include infection-fighting white blood cells, a more specific adaptive response kicks in, triggering production of cells that target the invader. These include antibodies that can recognize a virus and lock onto it, preventing its entry into a person's cells, as well as T cells that can kill both invaders and the cells they have infected. T cells are often important in controlling viral infections. We are seeing evidence of that. John Wary, the director of the University of Pennsylvania Institute for Immunology, told Reuters. He's a real scientist talking about this. This is, this is not, you know, hey... You know, drink, drink a bucket of sparkling water with some lemons in it and throw some zinc in there and you're cured or something, right? This is not some nonsense. This is real. Quote, a recent small French study found that six out of eight family members in close contact with relatives who had COVID-19 developed a T-cell response but did not test positive for antibodies. A Swedish study of 200 people found a strong T-cell response in most individuals who had mild illness or no symptoms following coronavirus infection, regardless of whether they showed an antibody response. The findings suggest that coronavirus infection rates may be higher than what has been studied using antibody tests alone. My friends, um, there's more. I mean, this this is stunning. And you're not hearing about, they don't want to talk about this. Because, and I'll get to why in a second. A study by the La Jolla Institute detected T cells that reacted to SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, in about half of stored blood samples collected between 2015 and 2018, suggesting that the immune system cells developed after previous infection 
with circulating common cold coronaviruses might help protect against the new virus. Now, why is this such a big, this is, this, if this is, if the implications of this are, are correct and true, here's what it, here's what it means. Um, in New York, they did serology testing a couple of months ago, and they found that about 20% of New Yorkers had antibodies. Now, this is millions of people. 20% had antibodies from exposure to or infection from the, now remember, some people are asymptomatic, but their body was exposed to COVID-19 and they developed the immune response that will protect them. 20%, okay. If this is correct, it would be even more common for people exposed to COVID-19 or that were, you know, had low level, low level symptoms or asymptomatic to have a T-cell immune system response that also stays in their system. So you would at least double what we know from the serology testing and probably considerably more than that. Let's say you get up to, uh, you know, just for for our purposes, if you're at 20% antibodies to COVID-19 and 20% T-cell response to COVID-19, in addition, you're at a 40%, you're at a 40% rate of of, uh, of herd immunity. Now, true herd immunity would mean that there's so many people that are protected from the virus that even people that are not protected are fine. You're, you might not be there at 40, but once you get to 50, 60 percent, you're basically there. It means it's very hard for this disease to spread widely among the population, including those that haven't yet developed that immune system response. Now, why is this so important? That would explain how in New York, where effectively the virus spread unencumbered with the, you know, the greatest population density, the subway operating, bars and restaurants. And I'd look at someone like myself. Did, did I have a, a uh, if I took a serology test, I haven't yet. I'm planning to do it soon, hopefully. If I took a serology test and it showed uh, that I don't have antibodies, I'd be willing to bet that I have a T-cell response. Because I'm somebody who was in the absolute peak of this, of this virus's spread in the subways, crowded restaurants, crowded bars, crowded offices all the time. Crowded building that I live in that I wouldn't have been exposed to this, uh, to me, just defies logic. And I know there are, there are millions of people like me that, would not necess- that have not had what they know to be COVID-19 yet and... May not, have ser- may not have a positive finding on a serology test. What this would likely mean is that the New York is essentially past the maximum spread phase, and there could be small outbreaks, but they're always going to be blocked from becoming major outbreaks because a lot of the population is protected from it naturally. And with more and more young, healthy people getting exposed to this and developing protection from it, that window, the, the, ex, the available targets, if you will, of the virus that are going to be, it's going to be really dangerous for them, keeps getting, that window keeps getting smaller and smaller, right? That's how herd immunity works. That's what seems plausible in a place like New York. People can tell me all day that they think that it's because of mask wearing and social distancing. To them, I just want to say, New York did those things, and this virus was, was ripping through this city for two solid months with, with seemingly you know, no end in sight, and then all of a sudden it started to go down. They claim it's because of the lockdown. But Sweden never had a lockdown, for example, and now has almost no deaths, from, I mean, minimal deaths from COVID-19 happening, and cases are way, way down. So we're assuming. So this is why. And now you get into the why they're not going to tell you the truth about this. Now you're going to get into why there'll be a suppression of this. Two reasons. On the one hand, can you imagine what the public health community is going to look like if it turns out that all this stuff that we're doing, all this, oh, you know, the, the, the hand washing and the mitigation and the wear a mask. Sometimes I said, don't wear a mask. Now I'm saying do wear a mask, you know, to vouch. 
all over the place telling you to do this and that and the other thing. And you know, what what would we think if if it, we became it became very clear that that was all the equivalent of uh, antivirus theater? That it really didn't make any difference. Are you ever going to listen to the you know public health authorities during a pandemic again? So they're hugely invested. And, you know, the science people that have spent their lives studying this and everything else have had basically no answers for us on a lot of this, still don't have answers. And if it, if it is clear that we've just been dragged toward herd immunity with the most economic pain possible, the most uh, violation of our rights possible, if that's what we find out and we still suffer the same amount of death and the same amount of infection and everything, Think about what that's going to look like for the people who push those policies and who have been so sanctimonious and self-righteous during the whole thing. And then it also, of course, there's the political level. There's the political level here where if we see that where we're just going, uh, that the smartest policy is to reopen, protect the vulnerable, and allow the disease over time to move through the low-risk population the same way that we accept every year that there is a flu and everything else, but you know it's worse for older people than the flu. I get that, but allow to move through the lowest population so they develop herd immunity, and then we can get back to our lives. We can get back to normalcy. The Democrats don't want that to be the case because they know that then their biggest election issue uh, is gone. So this theory that, as I've told you, it's I'm reading this from completely reputable sources. And reputable experts, uh, th- that theory is going to be under the surface. The studies necessary to prove this correct, the, there will be people. And I know you'd think, come on, we're in a pandemic. Can't they put politics aside? No. Nope. There are people who don't want to believe this. They really don't want to believe this. How, how foolish. Just think of people that you know in your own life. I mean, I've always said we don't really know. There's a lot of uncertainty. How? You know, maybe masks sometimes are a good idea, but other times they're clearly not or they're they're meaningless. We don't need to use them. There have been people who have been shrieking at everybody, in some cases, the case is quite literally in their lives, that you better wear a mask all the time, even if you have no symptoms. And you'd be washing your hands like somebody who's got a, you know, a compulsion. Or else you're a reckless person who's 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 literally costing lives. That's what, they'll, that's what they've been saying. How do you think they'll feel if it turns out that all that was just really irrelevant? They, they'll never believe it. People will continue to fight over this forever, even though increasingly, it seems to me, part of, you know, part of the desire to push for the lockdowns is desire uh, to make sure that we don't get to see what happens in places like Texas after we've already seen what happens in a place like New York where, or, or a place like California, for example, where they've had mask mandates for months now, and it would just prove that this lockdown doesn't really do anything and that we put ourselves through that. I mean, the virus is real. It's horrible. It kills people. But what we may be facing is this reality in which the virus is going to do what it does, and a lot of the public policy around this has been that where people have been so certain um, was idiocy, was self defeating and unnecessary. I cannot say that definitively yet because, as I've told you, this is a theory about the the white blood cell response to this, uh, the the T cell response to this specifically, and how that might factor into herd immunity. But I'm telling you this right now, New York, it it, it didn't make a difference when we were wearing masks when the spread was terrible. And it doesn't feel like it's making a difference now when there's basically no cases and people are still wearing masks all over the place to tell us that this is on us, like our behavior. If only we weren't naughty, there would be no virus. I think that's insulting. I think that's insulting. I think people have done what they're told and there's still a lot of folks getting sick. And we 
do want to get our schools open. You know, it has virtually no impact on children. They're just stronger than we are, the mothers and the fathers and the kids. They want the school open. You know, there's danger in not opening, too. You understand that. We've been seeing these reports in their horror shows when you stay at home and you can't get out, you can't do what you want to do, and that causes a lot of problems. It even causes death, frankly. So we want the schools open, and uh, Georgia has been a great example of a state that's done it all right. It's pretty straightforward. Open the schools. Seems to me like there shouldn't be a whole lot of disagreement about this, but as we know, it's it's not about what the science tells us. It's it's not about what the truth of this is. It, it's ultimately just about finding yet another reason to keep the American people in this this state of uh, of continuing unease and and misery. And that's the plan. Everything else is really just, uh, oh, oh, you know, you can talk about it. You can say, why aren't we having a more constructive conversation here? And the reason is that they don't want to have a constructive conversation. They want the schools to be shut down. Teachers unions have also given us all a reminder of how uh, utterly uh, corrupt and worthless Democrat uh, they are. And they're really just Democrat super PACs. You have, uh, oh, bro Cuomo. Let's hear from him. He's like, hey, hey, where's my creatine? Play 17. You tell me how a president in the middle of a pandemic has got time for this bull. Are you kidding me? Hawking products. I don't care who it is. Resolute desk. This is what he's resolute about. Pandemic priorities. His daughter, Ivanka, top White House advisor. Are you kidding me? Marketing for a brand following calls for boycotts after Goya's CEO heaped praise on Trump last week. On your dime, in the middle of a pandemic, they're selling beans? Are you you kidding me? Seriously. Seriously. This is not left and right. This is reasonable, my brothers and sisters. The guy's sitting on the Resolute desk with a bunch of Goya products. This is from the guy whose brother made the single worst public policy decision of the entire pandemic, leading to likely hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths. While he was doing a whole variety show about, oh, what did mom say? Well, mom, you're my favorite. You're his favorite. Uh, every night on CNN. You know, night, well, not every night, but night after night on CNN. But now it's all, how do you have time for this? You could play the how do you have time for this game with any politician at any point in time. It's it's just cheap theatrics, but at least it's theatrics over at CNN. That was the most interesting Cuomo segment I've seen in a long time, dumb as it may be.